Howdy, welcome to another episode of Cannon Calls. This week, I have the pleasure of chatting with the president of the Chesterton Society, Dale Alquist. We chat about G.K. Chesterton's life and work and how he got tied up into all of it. Before we jump into all of that, do not forget that Cannon Press's annual fall sale is this week. It goes through Sunday night at midnight. So don't miss out 30% off almost everything in the store and orders over $25 get free shipping. So if you would like to see the Chestertonian Calvinism talked about in the episode at work and on sale, head over to canonpress.com and fill up your cart. Thanks. Mr. Alquist, thank you again for taking the time to talk with us. Your name has become almost synonymous with whenever I pick up a, a Chesterton book, whether you did an intro or a, a foreword. So it's an honor to talk to you, and I, again, thank you. Yeah, well, you're very welcome. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Can you introduce us to G.K. Chesterton? If somebody if somebody has never heard of him, what's your what's your general pitch? Well, Chesterton, I, I just going to just come out and say it. He's the he's the best writer of the 20th century. So there, that's how we start the conversation. Okay. <laughs> so, so okay, everybody's hooked. All right, and uh, there's there's many many ways that he qualifies as that. First of all, he's uh, he's absolutely accomplished in every genre of literature that he ever uh, picked up his pen uh, to write in. He was uh, a great novelist and poet. He wrote plays. Uh, he wrote books on history and theology and philosophy and art and literary criticism and politics and economics and psychology. And if I've left any of the girls out, they're all uh, covered as well. But he was primarily a journalist and uh, a leading essayist of his day, really one of the great master essayists in the English language. And there, in, in using that... Uh, that medium, he wrote about everything, and his writing is just very prophetic, even though he lived a hundred years ago. He seems to be describing the world that we live in today, just uh, very observant of the attacks on traditional morality, the attacks on the family, uh, the attacks on the faith, and yet he does it with great joy and aplomb and uh and just artistic but completely witty and uh, a joy to read there's a few guys in the office here who are reading through in defense of sanity compiled by yourself yes and those are just almost just sketches um and we read one a day and then we chat about it at some point um terrific who was he what what you said he was he lived 100 years ago yeah so he he died in 1936 he did all of his writing during the first third of the of the 20th century there, and, and primarily made his living as as a journalist. That was his bread and butter. Uh, so he he did make his living as a writer. Um, he had uh, a couple of good gigs that uh, kept him solid. As he he wrote a um, a weekly column for the Illustrated London News for over 30 years. Hmm. He was a a regular columnist for the Daily News uh, and some other papers as well. And then he uh, actually for the last uh, 11 years of his life, published his own newspaper, GK's Weekly. So you mentioned he was prophetic. What exactly was it that Chesterton at the time uh, was sort of fighting against or writing against? <laughs> well, he saw, um, he, first of all, uh, he saw our uh, increasing dependence on technology and on uh, our our dependence on the machine and on things that we can't control, so that eventually he saw them controlling us instead. Uh, you know, he said we're learning to do a great many clever things. The next thing we're going to have to learn is not to do them. <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he saw that there would be this this downfall of the family as the basic unit of society. With, with, the, with the breakup of families through divorce and um, through uh, contraception and birth control and attack on life itself. Um, he, he said when he found out that Amer Americans could be divorced for incompatibility, he said, well, 
then they should all be divorced because men and women as such are incompatible. <laughs> the whole point of marriage is to work through the incompatibility. He says, you know, it's the most amazing feat of engineering in history, the bridge built between a man and a woman. And so he's very much the romantic, but also very practical. He saw that um, the government takeover of education would be destructive for the for the family, that you, you can't give your child over to the government at the most formative time in their life. Uh, the parent needs to control education. Even, even if they send the child to school, the school should be uh, accountable to the parents, not the parents accountable to the school. Mm. And, uh, you know, we've, we've sort of gotten that one mixed up. It, <laughs> it's really teach anything unless you, you, you have a, you know, a theological glory to hold together the fact. And so we're just teaching disjointed facts and uh, uh, children are learning to think in fragments because they can't think complete thoughts anymore. Uh, he also uh, he also warned uh, during his own time. He saw the he warned against the rise of Nazi Germany before anyone else saw it. Uh, he he warned about communism before anyone else realized how dangerous it was, and so very prophetic in, in that sense as well. But uh, you know, I think what what's interesting is the, the thing about a prophet is that a prophet really is telling you what will happen if you don't change your behavior, not what will inevitably happen no matter what you, you do. And I think Chesterton is, is always preaching the idea of free will, that we have to take responsibility for our actions. Several of your books you've written uh, on Chesterton quite a bit, and I noticed that few of them had the word common sense in them. Well, common sense is the idea that uh, everyone uh, shares... A notion of what is right, and um, they have sort of been dissuaded against notions of common sense by um, an intellectual elite, by um, you know the the professional academia, by the media, by professional entertainment, and because all those things are attacks on common sense, <laughs> and um, and so Chester is always the one. Defending the things that we all know to be true, but we don't, we don't simply stand up and articulate them. Uh, and uh, and people read Chester and they go, "Oh yeah, that's right. I wish I would have said that because that's absolutely <laughs> right." By this time, the guy that you're elevator pitching is riveted. So, what? Where would you send him first? What are <laughs> what are your usual go tos as far as introductions uh, concerning his writing? Well, I. You know, not to be self-serving, but uh, well, you know, I've written two two books that are really designed just to introduce people to Chesterton. I, okay. I I love when people read Chesterton. I encourage them to read Chesterton, but a lot of times they they pick up their first Chesterton book and they're not quite sure what to do with it because he doesn't write like anybody else, and he can be uh, just a little intimidating because. Uh, he, he throws you off balance, okay? So my my books are designed to, to be the door, to get get you in, and then you can start wandering freely. But, yeah, the Apostle of Common Sense is one of them, and then the other one is Common Sense 101, Lessons from G.K. Chesterton. And I really do recommend people start with those books. But then once they start reading Chesterton, uh, you know, that book of essays that you referred to, In Defense of Sanity, um, the Father Brown stories, uh, his book Orthodoxy, uh, those, those are all important uh, b books to read at some point. You did mention he's got so many in different genres that you really can kind of just pick your cup of tea and, and read him there. That's right. So, Mr. Alquist, do you mind introducing us to you? And then how, how did you get tied up? You run the Chesterton Society you've written books on them. So how, how did you in particular get tied up with G.K. Chesterton? Well, uh, when I first read Chesterton, it was, um, I had the, the same experience that uh, the great English writer Dorothy L. Sayers said that she had when she first read Chesterton. She said it was like a strong wind coming into the building and blowing out all the windows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, he has, it was just so refreshing to, to read someone uh, a refreshing approach to everything, I just wasn't used to it. I, I was just used to reading kind of narrow, plodding writers who, uh, 
you know, maybe made their one point. Uh, and uh, it's, it's one of the reasons why he's not better known is because he seems to defy any particular category. Uh, you can't put him into one category because uh, he's writing about everything and all these different subjects and putting them all together. And it's really um, liberating to, to read a writer like that. Um, and so I just I just couldn't get enough of Chester when I started reading him. And this was back in the early 80s, and most of his books were out of print at this point, so it meant combing through used bookstores to find his books. And uh, eventually I found that there were one or two other people out there who liked Chesterton as well, because he'd, he'd been quite forgotten by this point. And uh, we... Uh, we formed a little group that started meeting regularly and uh, the numbers slowly started growing. And I started the, um, the Chester society in, in uh, the late 1990s. And uh, the, the goal was simply, I'm not going to, not going to let the next generation be cheated the, the way my generation was. This is a, this is a writer people deserve to discover. And then here you are. That's obviously grown substantially. So you you found that other people were in fact interested once they discovered him. And yes, absolutely. The, the people came out of the woodwork who actually had been secretly reading Chesterton, but then <laughs> but then there was you know the new generation that discovered him, and uh, a lot of them had you know really similar reactions, which was anger. Uh, why haven't I been exposed to this right? How did I get an education? How did I get through school? And no one teaching me this obviously important uh, giant of English literature. And he had quite a few contemporaries who are large personalities as well. You mentioned Dorothy Sayers. She's got a lot, a lot of great writings. Uh, C.S. Lewis was around at the time. They overlapped somewhat. Lewis and Dorothy L. Sayers, you know, would be the half generation after Chester. They're about 20 years younger than he is. Right. Um, you know, and... But yeah, they were very influenced by Chesterton and great admirers of him. Um, in his in his own day, uh, he was one of the most popular writers in the world. So that's what's so astonishing that he uh, could disappear so entirely. It's because the people whose jobs it is to uh, to teach us about those writers didn't do it. He, There's a an American journalist named H. L. Mencken who is prolific in his own right here in the States, and he's got plenty of writings talking about G.K. Chesterton overseas. He, he had two American-speaking tours, uh, one in 1921 and one in 1930 and 31, and everywhere he went in the United States, he spoke to packed houses. It was front-page news everywhere he went. He was, he was really popular. <laughs> he's a, and he's, oh, not only was his personality large, he was a fairly large individual. Yes, yes, a large, uh, large body in, in which to house the large personality. He was uh, very, very famously said uh, that he was the politest man in all of England because he could stand up on a bus and offer his seat to three women at one time. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, uh, I'm going to butcher it, but I think it was P.G. Wodehouse that said a large, defined a large noise as G.K. Chesterton falling on a uh, sheet of tin. Yeah, something like that, right. So he, he, I think he was, he was comparing... Yeah, P.G. Woodhouse had a line about Chesterton to the corrugated tin roof. Yeah, yeah. I remember what it, I can't, it was something about that, right? <laughs> okay, so as far as the Chesterton Society goes now, so what what are you guys up to in 2019? Yeah, our website is chesterton.org, um, and uh, there's just a, a great source of information there um, on Chesterton and on our doings. We have, uh, there's local Chester Societies all around the country that meet on a regular basis just to read his books together and discuss them together. It's a great way to read Chesterton is to be part of a local uh, society, a local group, um, and always very interesting people. Uh, we have a national conference uh, each summer, uh, first weekend of August. We publish a magazine, Gilbert Magazine, and uh, that's always filled with uh, uh probably previously uncollected essays, but lots of good Chester quotations. And then uh, columns by contemporary writers who, you know, apply Chesterton's ideas to today's world. And uh, then we publish books, too, and I do a lot of writing and speaking. 
uh, you know, we, we just really feel that Chesterton is uh, a prophet, but he's also a good friend to have in today's world. Uh, you know, there's there's something joyful about his uh, his Christian presence uh, that is sadly lacking in a, in a very dark and depressing world today. So to practice a little bit of conjecture, what uh, what would Chesterton think of the state of reality currently? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, we we, we don't have to really uh, speculate too much. Chesterton might say because we just can look about what he what he did say. Sure. Uh, that's what's that's what's so much fun to to just pick him up and read him, and he seems to be describing the world we live in today. Um, with its uh, uh, dark view, a uh, very depressing view of uh, of the world, um, its its reliance on uh, things that we can't control, uh, third politics, uh, the the way things just really are falling apart at the seams, and it's it's really because we've we've lost our faith, hmm. and we've we've lost our way, Chesterton. Says man has always lost his way, but now he's lost his address. <laughs> That's really good. His book, What's Wrong with the World, describes, as you were saying, our modern world, but it was just in seed form there. So he's got great stuff on the suffragettes that can immediately apply. You can just see that mm-hmm. having grown and uh, chapters on all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. He, it, that book was written in 1910, and he, he uh, identifies four things that are wrong with the world. This is in 1910. Big government, big business, feminism, and education. What was the last one? Public education. Could pretty much define today as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm curious to know, was Chesterton annoyed by anything more than Calvinism? <laughs> well, um, his you know, the problem with Calvinism was it's... Um, it's it's narrow-minded view of predestination, and he says, you know, that paved the gr- the way for all the bad philosophies in um, Western civilization that came after it, because they all were some form of attack on free will. Uh, whether it was Darwin, who uh, tried to explain everything through biology. Or Marx, who tried to explain everything through economics, or Freud, who tried to explain everything through sex and psychology, uh, you know, uh, things that are, are set in, in our lives that we can't control. And it, it's, it just robs the human being of his dignity because he doesn't have free will. And, uh, and so uh, his criticism of Calvin is not what he did so much for religion, but what he did for secular thinking. So you are saying he would roll over in his grave if maybe if a core foundation of a of a business was to uh, exert a Chestertonian Calvinism. <laughs> Chestertonian <laughs> Calvinism. That that sort of sounds like a round square or something. <laughs> I I, don't, I think he'd be uh, uh, bizarrely uh, amused by by such a combination. Yeah. Well, that's very. Uh, I think I think you might be um, along the oxymorons of Microsoft Works, which I think is one of the other great uh, oxymorons. As the king of paradox, we tip the hat. Okay. Anything big on the horizon for you guys? What's what's uh? Is there anything we can point our folks to? What what are you guys up to? Well, uh, certainly if they go to Chester dot org, um, there's there's good stuff on there. There's a, right now where they could sign up for a daily quote coming from Chesterton. Um, and, uh, that's it. we're doing 60 days up until I think the beginning of Advent. And so, uh, uh, get, sign up for a daily quote. Uh, Chesterton's, um, one liners are just magnificent. <laughs> and, uh, it's okay. also a great way to start the day, right? Take, take one of his favorite ones. Uh, one of my favorites, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. Maybe one of my last questions for you. Uh, as somebody who has dedicated a lot of your time and life to the works of Chesterton, do you ever have this sneaking fit? Like, do you ever wonder, would Chesterton like me? Would Chesterton like me? Well, Chesterton seemed to be someone who loved uh, all people. He he really was uh, uh, known for his great... Um, 
his great joy in the presence of others. He was known for uh, listening uh, as as much as talking. People wanted to hear what he had to say, but he was more interested in what you had to say, and that was uh, one of the great personal qualities about him. But uh, people have asked me, well, what what would you uh, ask Chesterton if you were with him? And I and I, I, it occurred to me, Chesterton's really already answered all my questions. With his right. <laughs> I, would, I would just appreciate the opportunity and sit and listen to whatever he had to say about anything. Mr. Alquist, thank you so much again for taking the time. We really appreciate it. You can find your books on Amazon at your website. Is it ChestertonSociety.org? Yeah, yeah. Don't go to Amazon. That's a big business. Oh, that's um, right. I forgot. You know, so go to Chesterton.org. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, so Chesterton.org. Uh, right, just Chesterton.org. Okay, right. awesome. And then you have talks everywhere. People can go find those. Just put in your name in Google. Yes. Awesome. Thank you again, sir. God bless. Thank you for the interview. Bye-bye. Appreciate it.